professor world today people are growing more and more distrustful of science and super technology and not always without reasons so let's dispose of any suspicion uh, of conflict of interest between your academic work and your business involvement please forgive the following question about it is it is why should we trust you that's an excellent excellent question Paolo. i i would say that uh, you know the, the my own personal uh, view of of things is that uh, I, I have to disclose conflicts of interest. Uh, we all have conflicts of interest, uh, and and I have uh, significant uh, business interests as a consequence of my entrepreneurship. But uh, I keep those separate from my science, and and the reason for that is that uh, uh, I think academics have one reputation, and uh, they only have one chance to uh, destroy that reputation. And so if you are uh, uh, dishonest and not reputable, uh, uh, people will find out and then uh, you've, you've lost your credibility. Very well. This interview will all be about what science does not know about COV-2 immunity and vaccination. Let's start from the genome. Uh, I will quote to you Professor Wayne Marasco, a colleague of yours at Harvard. Uh, he said to me, quote, because the COV-2 genome is so large, 30 kilobases, it's difficult to know if other COVID-19 genes are mutating and leading to greater pathogenesis. So the question is, what are the most serious gaps in the understanding of the COV-2 genome today? Well, uh, uh, Professor Marasco is... is is the expert on this, and, and I, I would defer to his expertise in this particular area. But what I would say is that uh, from, from a, the, the perspective of, of deficiencies in knowledge, it's uh, simply that we just have not uh, sequenced enough, enough uh, of the viruses from enough people. It's the biggest unknown from the perspective of, uh, of, of the viral genome and how it mutates and, and uh, potentially how you know how those mutations will will change uh, how how we encounter the, the virus the next time it comes around, similar to influenza. But you know there there is clearly a genetic component to this, uh, meaning that uh, we we see that for example the the uh, the pathogenicity uh, the, the severity of the disease runs in families. Uh, some families are very uh, uh, strongly affected by by the disease, and others are you know seem to be relatively uh, only mildly affected. And it could be that there's just regional differences in in the genetic makeup of of the population as well. Okay, good. That was one of the questions. Good. Okay, let, let's let's focus a bit more specifically on the this these immunity testing things uh, going going around. Uh, Dr. Lee uh, Gerke, if I pronounce it correctly, uh, a virologist and researcher a colleague of yours at Harvard and MIT, uh, said of the serological tests, quote, we still don't know if the antibodies uh, these tests pick up actually act against the virus. And, uh, um, and, unquote. and I doubled down with Dr. Alan Wells at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center that said, quote, I would shudder to use IgM and IgG testing to grant an immunity passport to anyone uh, to anyone. These tests are not ready for that. So my question is, uh, you know, these kits are being used now everywhere. What is missing here to make these assays truly reliable? What is missing? You're an that, expert. That's an excellent question and, and is, is uh, precisely the subject of research that is taking place in, in my laboratory at, at Harvard Medical School. And, and, and so the, the missing link is the, the um, specificity of the immune response. Uh, so so to, to, the, to the people who are listening and watching this, um, the, the virus expresses uh, the, the antibodies, the, the antibodies that are produced by the host, by somebody who's infected with the virus. Uh, there are four different proteins protein targets that the, the virus uh, produces. And so antibodies can be produced against any one of those four. And it's even more complex because there is 
a, a range of antibody types that are produced. These are the, the different immunoglobulins, IgA, IgG, IgM, uh, and there's some, some minor ones, IgD and I, IgE, but uh, in this particular uh, disease, which is a mucosal disease, that is, it, it affects the, 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 the mucus lining, uh, IgA turns out to be important, uh, IgM turns out to be important, and IgG turns out to be important. But each one of those different classes, there is a diversity of responses to each of those four proteins that targets that are on the virus. And so nobody knows yet which of those antibody responses and which of those proteins is a, a, an interaction that results in what's called neutralization. Right. That is not just binding to the virus, but yeah. binding to the virus in a way that activates the immune system to eliminate the virus from the body. And so that's the missing link right now. We if you just measure the total amount of, of antibody, IgG and IgM, as you described in these uh, tests that are, are quite pervasive, uh, you don't get any information about whether those antibodies are neutralizing or not, meaning that they're effective at uh, eliminating the virus. And so when, when the research is done to identify those individuals who have effectively cleared it and what the, the, the repertoire of antibodies exists in, in their bloodstream, then we will begin to get you know, some sense of, 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 uh, of how we can, can really attack this, this virus and perhaps even uh, how we can generate uh, uh, very uh, targeted vaccines. Right. Uh, yes, this has huge implications for social and labor uh, situations in countries, what you just said. So basically, if I understood correctly, you know, still technology has to advance quite a bit to produce a kit that really says you are immune or you're not. Okay, let's let's go on to vaccines, and uh, we're almost finished. <laughs> um, so, uh, to vaccines now. Now, uh, by the way, do you have wives, children, grandchildren, anything, if I may ask? Um, uh, I have uh, 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 two, two daughters, and I have uh, uh, four grandchildren. Uh, four very good, very well. Um, now, uh, you remember the 2017 uh, Sanofi and uh, Zika vaccine uh, fiasco. Uh, millions of dollars were being spent for that vaccine, but then the epidemic petered out by itself. However, Dr. David Morans of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases then said, quote, vaccines are certainly helpful for controlling outbreaks, but viruses tend to flare up, peter out, and then pop up again. So here we are, racing for a vaccine for a virus that's ridden with unknowns, the immune response to which we don't even fully understand, and that could flare up, badly mutated, any time. So for how long would you want a vaccine to have been tested before you give it to your grandchildren? Uh, 10 months? 24 months? How long? Be safe. Uh, well, I think there are uh, examples where uh, vaccines are completely ineffective. Uh, we know uh, 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 Dr. Fauci, who has been taking the lead in in, in the U.S. with respect to uh, this particular pandemic, uh, has been working on. Uh, trying to develop a vaccine for HIV for uh, nearly three decades now. But uh, the, the, the success of that, those vaccines has been elusive. Uh, and, and so uh, what I would say is the first thing that's going to be important is to demonstrate that the vaccine is, is actually effective at generating a neutralizing response and then that has to be scaled to enough, uh, a large enough cohort of the population uh, to be able to show that, that it doesn't induce any uh, 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 un undesirable side effects. Um, some vaccines you know, cause this uh, 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 
antibody enhanced uh, effect that that you know can can really uh, be be life threatening and, and and can cause death in some cases. So I would say specifically, you know, I would say something like eighteen months would be a reasonable expectation for uh, when you could begin to vaccinate the most vulnerable members of the population who have not been previously exposed. Uh, but that would have to have taken place with considerable uh, amount of testing in relatively large uh, uh, swaths of the population, you know, thousands of people to, to see, you know, are, are there going to be some rare, you know, rare events of, of, uh, of uh, uh, you know, some, some, some bad things that happen. Good. That, that is, it's, it's very important, Professor, that you gave us a parameter because you know what industry is like. You know, that maybe 10 months from now, somebody will pop up saying, oh, I have the vaccine. And Donald Trump would say, oh, that's great, you know. And so people will believe that's a good vaccine. And in 10 months, as you said, that's very, it's going to be very unlikely that that's going to be a good vaccine. So, um, what, I would say, but when, what I would say is that, you know, if, if there are some indications of efficacy, the, the effectiveness of the vaccine, and that, that there is, is you know, have not been serious side effects, you know, 10 months, it may be that we really do have to, you know, begin to, to vaccinate some of the most vulnerable people, you know, people that are, are, are extremely old, that you know, we, we, we know that if they get the disease would, would probably be unlikely to recover um, because the risk may, may just be better. Uh, you know, the, the, the benefit, risk benefit analysis may just, uh, you know, be, be at that level. But I would say that sort of in the conventional thinking, one would not want to rush uh, the, these kinds of vaccines, you know, past uh, you know, earlier than something like an 18-month kind of time frame. Yeah, so. because it, it's, it's going to be very likely that legislators will force everybody to be vaccinated. So that's, the, you know, it's important. What you're saying is very important. Now, we, we, we have one minute left. It's all following our guidelines and making the sacrifices required to overcome I, I don't know what this terrible sounds like. threat more aggressively. I don't know. Donald we, Trump is speaking to us, sir. So it sure. sounds like it. I don't know what's, what's happening. So, again, to conclude, what's the single unknown about this virus that keeps you up at night? You know, at the moment, I would say that what, what we've already discussed, and that is the link between the, the, the uh, production of antibodies by individuals who are infected or have been infected and the protection that those antibodies uh, uh, serve. I, I think that, to me, is is something that uh, I, I'm 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 uh, frightened by the, the the proposition that you know this passport back into society will rely on something that has at, at the moment no real scientific evidence to back it. Okay, thank you very much for the interview. Um, it's been very 